Changing the Sales Game on webtalkradio.net. I'm your host, Connie Whitman. As always, I'm beyond happy that you're here today. And I hope as you listen to the show that, of course, you feel my passion about helping you on your journey of, of change, especially as it relates to sales, career, all those things. Because really, really, we're selling all the time. I don't know that we realize that or not. So to help you on your journey of changing your sales game, please, in the show notes, I have my free communication style assessment link. It gives you two reports. One, spotlighting your natural communication superpowers, kind of how you show up. And then you receive also a secondary report, which is your lowest score, which is a blind spot. Very, very important to understand our blind spots, because how are we showing up? If it's something that's in our blind spot, we might actually miss it and thus leave business on the table. Also, if you're loving the show, and which I hope you do, you find uh, the information my guests and I cover very informative and useful, please subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Share with your peeps because sharing is caring. And if you'd rate and review it, so appreciate that. And I do read the love notes. I appreciate them as well. Now, today, my motivational quote to kind of set the stage for the conversation is by Dave Ramsey. And Dave says, money is 80% behavior, 20% head knowledge. It's what you do, not what you know. Now, I love the 80-20 rule, right? It's true for, I think, every aspect, both in our personal and our professional lives. So, of course, the 80-20 rule would be true for money habits too, right? Now, we all know you can't save and spend at the same time. To me, that's a good example of knowledge. Yet, how hard is it to save when our families or you need things? So, for example, the car needs to get fixed or even worse, you need to buy a new car and you have to take on that car payment again, right? Cars aren't a luxury anymore. They're a necessity. So I understand saving and spending kind of a tough one. So money seems to slip away easily, especially if we don't have a financial plan in place. So today you're in store for a real treat. My guest is uh, Kim Curtis. Now, Kim is the best-selling author of Money Secrets, Keep to Smart Investing and Retirement Secrets. She's a nationally recognized wealth management advisor and president and CEO of Wealth Legacy Institute. Now, her groundbreaking work in developing a highly personal client client-centric planning model and was recognized in the Journal of Practical Estate Planning. And she's also, uh, she also won the Editor's Choice Award. Award. She has been profiled in several publications, including Wall Street Journal. And Kim has attained numerous professional designations and has been recognized by the financial planning industry as having achieved the highest level of competency um, and expertise. So please help me welcome the amazing, brilliant (laughs) Kim to the show. So Kim, and thanks for being on. <laughs> thanks, Connie. One of my favorite topics, by the way, Kim, talk about money. <laughs> I love it. I know, right? Because it really is an important energetic thing that we mm-hmm. have in our life. And I think that we worry about money and other things. But if you have a plan in place, I think we can breathe a little bit easier, right? So, no doubt. Yeah, no doubt. So what is, for you, what is a holistic approach to finance? To find that right out of the gate for us. Oh, you're really going to take me there right out of the gate. I love yeah. that, Connie. You know, I think that that in my life's work, there's been one overriding truth. And that is that actually money is looking for you. Not the opposite. We always say, I need money, I need money, I need money. Well, sure, you will always need money. But actually money needs you to become something. So if we could switch that paradigm that, no, it's not you need money, but money needs you, that will actually start to change some of the circuits that we have on how we approach it. I love it. Can you so, give us an, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, can you give us an example of what you mean by that? Yeah, yeah. So when you think of what is, what is money, right? We created it. So we created it back in the day for global exchange. Beyond that, all it is is the meaning we give it. And we give it a lot of meaning. So if in fact money has no meaning, it's kind of empty other than the meaning we give it, then that gets back to what you said on that 80-20, 80% behavior. 
that gets back to your mindset of how you view money. And so many of us walk through life very unconscious about money. We have no, you know, we don't even, we think about scarcity. Absolutely. When we don't have it, we're always thinking about scarcity and fear. Yes. But if we approached it, that money needs your ideas, your vision, your values to turn it into something valuable of use to the world. Then all of a sudden, well, ideas are abundant. If money needs my ideas, well, I could come up with ideas because that's who I am in life. We all have our own ideas around it. Sure. And if we know that ideas are abundant, then, then money ultimately has to be abundant. And I can go deeper into that. We started out of the gate because you gave me such a big question. Uh, but and I'll answer it more practically as we move along. But I really wanted to put that out there because it's really a cornerstone of a mind shift that changes a lot. But isn't that the truth for everything, Kim? I think every, <laughs> like I know even my sales classes, the first module is about communication, obviously, but then it's mindset because mm -hmm. it's that word sales. I hear that word sales and I go, oh, I don't want to sell. It's not part of my job. I hate it. Do you? Do you even know what it means? Right. Mm -hmm. So I think it always starts with mindset. And then once we we can identify, define, get comfortable with within our own mind, the rest becomes kind of easy but it starts in our minds and our mind is, is really, really powerful. Yeah. Those limited beliefs that yeah. occur so early on, oftentimes money beliefs, you probably already have, we come into this world with already a blueprint. Yes. That blueprint may help you with money or may not help you as much with money, yeah. but that's just a really little small gift where it really comes in is after say 15, when we start to learn about money and start to implement but we're observing all the time, watching what our parents do. And are our parents talking about money? Mine never talked about money. Yeah. And so what is your first money memory? Was it positive? Was it negative? And then when you start to think of what are the money messages that you got in your household, a lot of people got, it's not appropriate to talk about money or money's not spiritual or money's not uh, dirty or rich people are a certain way. When you start to unpack all of those stories that you heard and wonder whether they're true or not, a really good example, Connie, is just out of the gate in our conversation when I said, money is looking for you. I wonder how many of your listeners were like, what is she talking about? Absolutely. Skeptic, you know, or skeptic, well, oh, man, that's crazy. Or maybe some of your, your listeners were instantly curious and know that there's something here for them in the conversation we're about to have. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I hope they, you know, again, it's all about the value that we can bring. And I think the more we shine light on things that I'm going to use the word scary. I don't know if it's scary, more fear driven, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, 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 it gets rid of the mystery and the misunderstanding of things. And then now we're, we're coming from a place of power that we can make a choice on which direction we want to go in or how we want to proceed understanding this new information. So that's why I was excited about this conversation, because I know one of my earliest memories I was about five years old and um, passed some big houses. I, I grew up in Newark here in New Jersey and the mob lived there, right? The, the mafia. And so I questioned these big houses and my mom and dad at the same time, crooks live there, bad people live there. They have guns, they, you know, they kill people. And so as a five-year-old, I associated, oh, big, beautiful houses, crooks. And later in life, that actually came out of my mouth um, without even realizing it. And I had to kind of go back and figure out where did that come from? Because it was very deep rooted. I knew that. Mm -hmm. But I thought, wow, where? why would I even think that? Well, it's a, a child's re reaction. I see a big house, crooks live there. And that's what it was embedded in my in my um, blueprint, right? It, it, it's innocently done. Yet what are the repercussions over time? So, well, and I love that. That is yes. such a great story. And the fact that you could articulate it and you unpacked it. Think of the family ones are sort of easy. It's the cultural ones Absolutely. that attach to us that we don't even know the messaging that we're getting because we're swimming in it. Absolutely. You can't see the forest from the trees. Absolutely. Right. How, right. how can we improve the relationship with money? Like, do you have some tips so that we can shift that paradigm of thinking? Well, we're already starting about it by the limiting beliefs. What are the money messages and what are the money myths? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, because like you think about it, you see a fancy Lamborghini or Ferrari and how many think, 
or take a, my son would take a picture as, as that car drove by. But how many other people go, what a waste of money for a vehicle. Or when we, pat, when we are on the street and there's a poor person, someone asking for money. So how many of us cross the street or how many of us have compassion? So those are like real quick triggers that that is your money receptor. And if you, if you and, and, and we also judge others on how they spend money. So Absolutely. if you understand what that receptor is, then the receptor, it, it, we have a receptor for our bodies of what our bodies need. You know, food, sunlight, you know, antigens all help our body adjust. Well, there's also, how do we turn that to the money receptor? Because it's visceral and we all have a reaction. So if we could be aware of those reactions, then we can start like you when you said, wow, where did that come from? You know, crooks live there. Okay, let me unpack that. What is my story? That was my parents' story. What is mine? And then once you come up with yours, all of a sudden you got to unpack it again because generationally you could be saying something that was your great grandpa's that's right that has come through blueprint on who you are you know he could have been the tightwad or something and all of a sudden yeah. you show up in that way so when you unpack all of the family stuff generationally and and you know this is in anything in life it doesn't have to be money but we also want to know what that is as parents because we don't want that to pass down to the next gen and our yes, grandchildren exactly so we got to interrupt it. And then we got to put in a new mindset, a new, a new, you know, when it clicks in, what are you yes. going to put in its place? That's either an affirmation of some sort or an intention that money follows me. Uh, you know, I get all that I need, you know, at any point in time, whatever works for you to, to put it to a positive versus a negative that you don't want to talk about. And you need to talk about money in your household yeah. because you want your children to be smart about money. Absolutely. And, and just a couple of things you put in there um, that I, I want to just make sure that my listeners are, are, are really hearing, right? Because we listen, but do we listen? So just a couple of things you said, the, um, the mind thought from our parents, and I'll give another example. It's not direct. Well, it is money, money driven. My dad came from Italy, right? Came to this country and, and worked really hard, literally started in construction, went to school at night to learn English. And then obviously married my mom, had a family, right? It was always work, work, work. And he says, and they'll say it to my kids, you have to work hard. That's the only way you get ahead. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not really true. And up until maybe about five years ago, I would work seven days a week, especially as a business owner for 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. Seven days a week. I got to work hard. If, I'm, if I want to make money, I got to work hard. If I want to be successful and all of a sudden, I don't know what work I was doing in my own growth, personal growth. And I thought, wait a minute, working hard is not really the equals to success and money, right? Working hard is burning me out and that, and I'm not good for anybody then. So am I really being, it's, it's Stephen Covey's, um, one of the laws, right? You got to sharpen, sharpen the, the saw. saw. Well, yeah. I never stopped to sharpen the saw because it was like, nope, got to work hard. Nose to the grindstone. It's the only way you're going to get ahead. So when he says that to my kids, I have to pause and I have to redirect, say, mm -hmm. yes, we all have to work hard. You have to show up. You have to perform, right? That's, that's our responsibility to whoever you work for. However, that doesn't mean you give your soul. That doesn't mean you work seven days a week right. and think, well, I'm not worth getting paid more, right? There's this whole <laughs> internal networking that goes with that. So that is that is that another good example of kind oh, of- Oh, it's a great saying? example. You hit on a number of different things. I wrote one down just so I wouldn't forget what you said uh, to comment on it. I think the best way to take it kind of in a deeper level, which is what you, you know, your own example is I could share my own. And that may help other people understand how to, have money, how to get better at uh, being responsible with money. Yeah. And my own story is that I actually, my parents got divorced when I was a teenager and my mom got full custody of three teenage girls. She had no employable skills. So we had government assisted school lunches. And I had this little red ticket that I would have to pass to that cashier five days a week. I'd go to the furthest line oh. away from all my friends and as I grabbed my plate, put it on my tray, I would in my pocket get the ticket and hide it underneath the plate as I slid down with the tray before handing it to her. Handing that was a huge act of shame, unworthiness. And how many listeners can appreciate shame and unworthiness and yeah. not enoughness when it comes yeah. to money? Yeah. So, so that was kind of the start of shame around money and unworthiness. And, and 
um, it, other people had money, not us. And, and other people knew where we stood because of that red ticket. Yeah. So, but my mom had one thing that she shared with her daughters, and that was to make sure you get your education because no one can take it away from you. Of exactly. course, from her perspective, that's true. Yes. And we did. I went to undergrad and then I went to law school. And after graduating, within six months, defaulted on my school loans. I had no money consciousness. I had no business understanding the debt that I had taken on. And at that time, it was about $92,000 in today's dollars. Wow. That was a lot back then. It was. And that was the law school experience that just took me over the edge. But I thought I was getting my education. I thought, like, work hard. That me get my education. It was like that. What are those stories that the generations before us tell us Absolutely. on what success is in their mind? And so there I was, no imp no understanding of the impact on my credit report, and with a legal degree, you know. And and now where I am today as a CEO of a wealth management firm. So there's a number of things that happened from there to here. Uh, and I could probably share some of my, you know, 30 years ago, what was that experience that I, if I could have given myself that message back then. Yeah. So there was something that happened to me that was very significant. There was um, an anonymous donor that put a thousand dollars on my school loan debt. And first of all, when you're in denial, you're not opening your, your debt statements, you're not opening your mail. And I always, well, every, something I say a lot is how you do money is how you do life. If your head is in the sand on money, trust me, there are other areas of your life yes. that your head is in the sand on because money is this invisible thread that navigates all the pieces of our human existence. It touches every piece from health to stress, to mind, to spiritual, all of it. It's all touched by money, even though we don't want it. We want to put it over here and separate it. So what happened when I opened that? And because it was anonymous, I couldn't go, why me? Or, oh, oh, no, 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 you shouldn't have. I had to ask that question to myself. And so if someone, and remember, $1,000 back then to me was like a million dollars. Like it oh. was huge. Of course. You know, when we think of 1000 today, okay, yeah. Um, but it was big. And so I was like, well, if someone believes in me, like, what do they believe in? And what do I believe in me? And then who am I? Who do I want to be? So when you think of all those peoples, whether they're teachers, when mentors back in the day that changed the course or direction of who we are today, it doesn't take much no. to make a difference in someone's life. Absolutely. And that was, at the time, it was, an, it was almost like a snap. And that snap was, God, I'm totally unconscious around that. What do I want to do about this? And that from, and it was like this, I wasn't respecting myself. Just like you in terms of working seven days a week, I had to have self-respect. And with self-respect, I realized, oh my gosh, I am the one that's 100% responsible for the outcomes in my life. Yeah. No one else. I can't blame the school system. I can't blame my dad. I can't blame my mom. I can't blame my dad for leaving my mom. It's up to me. That's right. And from that point forward, events happen that we have no control over, but we do have control over our response to those events. And that's Absolutely. choices, uh, which di dictate our outcomes. And so, and I knew from that point on that I had control of my outcome and that I was going to make a difference. So all of a sudden I became conscious and most importantly, what I felt from that gift besides understanding self-respect was um, love. It was an act of love. And that frequency of joy and love of someone else expressing it m got me to a place that I could have these other conversations with myself. It was a, such a great catalyst too, right? On, on like, wow, where'd that come from, right? Not even knowing, but yet it, it forced you to start to ask those inner questions. So you start mm -hmm. peeling back the onion and that's what it is. It's that one little charge that could change the trajectory. Yeah. Like you said, how you snap, it was like a snap 
Mm -hmm. that, wait a minute, wait, change my paradigm of thinking. Really all it was, it was a snap to have you peel back that onion a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper and a little bit. And then, you know, once you start within our own personal growth, it's hard to, once you know what the repercussion could be from a positive or negative standpoint, you can't go back to not knowing. That's right. So I think that was the piece. It was a snap or, or that layer got peeled back for you. And then you were able to navigate from there with a little bit smarter response because of that pivotal moment, which is we've all had those pivotal moments. And I think, hope everybody listening is like, oh, that happened to me when, right? Whatever that Mm -hmm. was for you, it's just kind of cool to, to put it under the microscope, if you will, or put it in the Petri dish. And let's start to examine that for ourselves, right? As you listen to the show. Other thing I want to go back to, as you said about, yeah, the kids, yeah. and I think it's really important that we teach our kids mm. about money. And I'll just share another quick story. So my one son graduated, um, had gotten offered a job and COVID hit and everything stopped. So now this kid just graduated, was ready to work, excited about working. And for two years, basically the world stopped and he had no opportunity. So I said, you want to work? I, my, my peers, my colleagues, gave him little pieces of work. We didn't pay him much, but it was enough to give, keep his education growth going, but Mm -hmm. also he had a little bit of pin money to pay for gas or whatever, not that we were going anywhere. Fast forward. uh, My husband and I, my my kids ask, how much do you make? We tell them, I tell them if it's a good year, I tell them if it's a bad year, there's a lean year because when you're in business, right, you have the ups and downs COVID my, my income completely stopped. Right. My kids knew I have these conversations. My husband has conversations. They need to understand what work ethic is, what payment is, their bosses and how they respond and how bosses respond to them. But all of it at the end of the day is making their way to become financially independent, financially aware and financially educated. Now, my one son has a finance degree and my other son has a marketing degree. Mm -hmm. They both had to take finance classes. So they're pretty good with that. But I'll tell you, Kim, they still come to me. Hey, mom, what would be a good budget? Hey, mom, mm-hmm. what should I do with this? Hey, dad, because my dad is a retirement expert. That's that's his world, you know, his mm-hmm. genius. Um, he helped them with the 401k. He helped them understand, maximize what's the contribution, all those things to further educate them with real life situations. And I know they, they tell me like their peers, they go, their parents never talk about money. I said, I think that's dangerous because you have to understand what the cost of living is. You have to understand what bills are. You have to Mm -hmm. understand, you know, if you're not happy at a company, is it because of the people? Is it because of the money? Is it because you're not chat, whatever, but you have to (laughs) constantly, um, um, refine what you're thinking about so you could continue to grow and earn money, right? As you, as you go through that, you get rewarded for that growth as well. Absolutely. Uh, oh. If you're not talking to your children about money, yeah. media is, and yeah. media is consumption. Yeah, that's right. So very All important to understand. That's right. That's right. right. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I want to, With my legal background, I was in negotiation, mediation, and arbitration. That was my area of expertise. And I moved up in the ranks and reported to the president in New York City. And what happened is I moved up in the ranks. I no longer was doing settlement conferences. I was no longer at the heart of the matter. So at age 30, uh, I ended up in finance from a quiz. Everyone, you know, hopefully everyone knows someone that's an HR or has access to those assessments. Oh, love of some I love sort. all of them. <laughs> yes. Who doesn't, right? Well, maybe some people, but I love them too. And so it said that my next, what I'd be good at was finance, financial planning. And so I'm thinking, piece of cake, you know, with my early success in three to five years, knock it out of the park. <laughs> then it was like, okay, five to seven. And then again, laughing again, like, whoa, I don't know what I don't know. It was truly the seven to 10 years for all you entrepreneurs out there, at least from my experience, there seems yeah. to be this sweet spot yeah. around the seven to 10 year time frame where you're starting to feel like you're making money yeah. in a way that you know what you're doing. And so that, that progression is how I got from that girl with the red ticket uh, to being where I am today. Love it. And I think that's important to understand because- the next part of answering that very first question that you asked in the beginning, and we've actually gave, given three different areas of how to yes. do it. The next is you got to follow your passion and your purpose. You're on this planet uniquely you and only someone, only you can do you. Um, and so if you are doing what you love, you've just crossed through the doorway 
to make life a lot easier and success a lot easier for you. Agree. Yeah. 100%. That's like the, the golden ticket is doing what you love. So when, when you talk about your son and the COVID and think of all of the listeners that have struggled with that through that time frame, not only emotionally and physically and, and financially, the, the, when money ebbs and flows, it's never full on like a fire hose as much as we would like it to be. It ebbs and flows. <laughs> and in where we are today with interest rates and inflation yeah. and capital market volatility, that in an ebb, it's our job to work on ourselves. We can't control the capital markets. We can only control ourselves. Right. So whether it be education or certifications or with your son doing all these different jobs that's allowing his skill set to improve that he has more to offer an employer. That's right. Or for those of you listeners who did have a job during that whole time, that you give more than is given to you. That's right. That your value, you do 20% more in value than what your paycheck is, and you will grow exponentially because there's another thing to consider here. You ready for it? Yes. Drum there, roll, please. <laughs> <laughs> Although the drum roll should have been on money is looking for you, but we could look back on that. No, there are two laws of money. Two laws of money. And the first is what we've been talking about. It's what I do every day. Financial planning, cash flow management, protection planning, investment, portfolio construction, tax mitigation, estate planning, right? Oh, Just nice. like that. I can do that in my sleep. Um, the and the other law is natural money law. And the natural money law, we actually inherently already have it. It's already in here. It's, it's, and we've lost sight of it, giving and receiving, cause and effect, supply and demand, clear agreements, even mercy and justice, uh, community. All of those things that if we were to think about male, female, relationship-based, it's already, for, particularly for women who tend to discount the word money or discount investments thinking, you know, that's not for them. The success around money actually starts on the inside on natural money laws. And we already generally have the skill sets. They've just become dormant. And we don't attach it to money because remember money is empty. It has no value until we put a value to it. So if you put relationships, your family, it's easy to think about money when you think you want the best for your family of course. or an entrepreneur. Oh, I can't charge that. You know, it just comes naturally to me. No, you charge your fair, fair value because when sure. you don't charge what you're worth, you're diminishing yourself. Absolutely. So when we talk about our children and kind of money, two laws of money, the one I do every day, financial planning, the other is uh natural money law, which I just suggested, you start on the natural money law to grow in money, but you need both in harmony. So when you start in the, in the, in the giving and receiving cause and effect supply intention and desire, that side community clear agreements, when you start on that side, you've built your confidence because there are a lot of people that have money, but are unhappy. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people that understand natural money laws that don't have a lot of money. Yes. So once you start there, then you have to educate yourself on the other side in the human made laws. So, 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 and then you build your expertise around spending and saving. And what does that look like? And retirement plans. And you start to read and you start to feel more confident. But what happens is people start on the, the, the human made laws first and then have a life that is empty. Yeah. Absolutely. And I just want to share one quick thing. We're almost out of time, but I remember I had yeah, one thanks. client many years ago. I was maybe in business, i say maybe nine years, maybe just around the 10 year mark. And I was fairly priced in the marketplace. And, you know, when, when I get a contract with, they were, they were my, most of my clients are corporate. So when I got the, you know, the corporate client, um, reviewing the contract with them, it was development costs because we were customizing. I only customize programs. I don't do anything cookie cutter because I don't believe mm -hmm. anybody's situation is cookie cutter. That's just how I run my business personally. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so I had to customize. So there's a little bit of development cost, And then my per diem when I come in and train. And, and that includes if we had meetings, if, the, if he wanted to go through the curriculum after the first class, do we need to make tweaks? All of that is included in the per diem, right? So he says to me, oh, that means you would make whatever the dollar amount is if you did, you know, 40 hours a week times 52 weeks. 
And I said to him, but you're not paying me 40 hours a week for 52 weeks, right? So I have other clients. I have to do business. So there's a lot more that goes into it than me just showing up and training your people. Meanwhile, he was bragging the entire time during our meeting, Kim, about his new Austin Martin that he had purchased, which at the time was probably about $150,000 car. I don't even know what that's worth today. So it was okay for him to succeed financially, but he was trying to break me down to catch his deal so that he could go spend more money on himself. And I I walked away from the business. His values did not align with mine. Mm -hmm. I didn't Mm -hmm. like the way he talked to his employees. Okay, not that it's any of my business, but that doesn't mean I have to subject myself to that kind of business. It was maybe a $20,000 contract, which wasn't little for me back then, right? That was a lot of money. I couldn't work with him because he made me feel that I wasn't worthy of what I was charging when I know I was fairly priced and, and, and net, no one ever asks me to negotiate my prices yet. Mm-hmm. He did. There was a level of disrespect I felt mm-hmm. and you don't disrespect me, right? I, I will mm-hmm. deliver a thousand percent for you, but you have to honor who I am and what I'm going to teach your people. So that's another thing. Be mindful. People are very quick to tear you down, mm-hmm. but it's for their agenda. It had nothing to do with me. He wanted to keep money in his pocket at the end of the day. So let me rip her off so I could go buy another nice car, right? So beware of that, that people are constantly trying to sabotage you, um, but it's nothing to do with you. It is not really has nothing to do with you. That had all to do with him. I just walked away. And Connie, that really nails de- the point home because that was heart-centered. You made the decision heart-centered. You knew you were in alignment with your values and who you are. And again, that will always take you in the right direction on long-term money success. And you know what the other thing too, Kim, I know if I had taken that business, that 20,000, he would have worked me for 40,000. So I would have put the effort out because I over deliver, right? That's how, that's just how I roll. I don't know how to be any other way. So I would have kept doing and doing and doing. So he would have gotten a $40,000 contract for the 20,000 because he knew, he knew who I was and I would over deliver, but I had to be the one to step in to say, no, this does, this works for you, but no, no, this doesn't work for me. And it's really hard when you're in the throes and like that 20,000, we needed that Mm 20,000. Let me tell you. But at what point do you sell your soul? It's a tough one, guys. You know, everybody listening, this is tough. This is really tough. And there are times where I did say, ah, let me just do Mm -hmm. it. You know, we need the money. And it was a miserable experience. So you live and learn, right? It's all about living and learning. We're out of time, but I want to share a couple of things with, with everybody listening, Kim. So first one, please go to Kim's website, which is wealth legacyinstitute.com. Of course, I will put that in the show notes. If you have questions directly for Kim, it's kcurtis at wealthlegacyinstitute.com. And you have a, a couple of wonderful free gifts. It's financial literacy press.com. I will put that in the show notes as well. But can you talk about um, the free gifts that they could find on there? Because they're very useful. Yes. Under financialliteracypress.com, we have the 10 laws of money that every investor should know. There's also tax tips that every investor should know. And we also have the aging parents checklist Yes, uh, that was put together when my I lost my mom this year in January. I'm and my so older si- Thank you. My older sister and I, being in the business, still missed a lot of things. And so was- this is packed with as much as creating a playlist so that when they can't speak, they have music that they love that they can listen to. Wow. That's how granular that aging parent checklist goes. So it's a great beautiful. piece. Yeah, beautiful. And, you know, a lot of my listeners are peers of mine, um, Kim. So, you know, my mom is 93 and my dad is 92. Oh. Yeah. And I've aunts and uncles, they're all from 80 to 97. We have a very, very long lifeline in my family, both sides, my mom and dad, but that aging parent, phew, Talk about mm. not knowing what you don't know and experiencing it in the moment. It's um, yeah. stressful, it's emotional, um, and yet you have to make decisions. So thank you so much. That's a beautiful, a beautiful gift for everyone. Uh, again, with aging parents, I highly recommend it because I too am going through that and it's, it's tough to navigate at times. So thank yeah. you. I, I, I am so honored that you gave three gifts. I t- talk about the trifecta of my, <laughs> my guest uh, giving <laughs> opportunity. So thank you for that. I love it. Mm-hmm. Thank you for being on and for sharing the wisdom, you know, the two money uh, two money laws, right? Yeah. The, the man-made and the and the individual, the the concept Natural of money. that that first concept right out of the gate, right? That stop 
chasing them. What did, how did you say it? Say it one more time. Cause it was so yeah. eloquent that, that money is looking for you. Money is looking for you. Not I the other it. way around. Yeah. Yeah. So picture it like a dog chasing a bone. The money's chasing you and trying to catch up to you. So, that's pause, right. so it, you allow it to catch up and do what you mm, need. That's good. Yeah. Thank you so much again for the gifts, for sharing so much great content. Highly recommend uh, you guys connecting with Kim. Um, If you have some random questions, run it by her. She might really be able to help you with your specific situation. Clearly well-versed in the world of finance and law, which is fascinating um, as well. Thank you so much for being on. Truly appreciate your time. Thanks, Connie. Love you, my friend. Uh, And I hope you will join me weekly as we question, build, and discover together, no matter where you are in your life, career, sale, whatever it is that you're dealing with, please, please, I hope that the show and my guests, not only is it interesting to listen, right, as we share stories and stuff, but please take this information and do something with it. Information's beautiful, but if you do nothing with it, it's just information. Take it, apply it. And really, really, I know I say this every week, but watch the magic that happens in your life when you take some of these ideas and and put them into into place. Um, Again, Kim, thank you for being on and thank you all for joining me weekly. And I truly am honored to have you on this journey with me. You've been listening to Changing the Sales Game with me, your host, Connie Whitman on webtalkradio.net. I truly wish you an inspired week filled with money, a lot of money yes. and prosperity and opportunity that all comes together. So again, have a blessed week, everyone. I love you all. And I'll see you next time. Have a great one. Mm-hmm.